all walks of life in the Green Movement. It's also a movement very much in flux, responding to a dramatically evolving situation with events and circumstances changing the equation from day to day, sometimes hour to hour. The movement is both responding to that state of flux and, in the process, growing. It's finding its voice and intellectual bearings, particularly in the widely discussed manifesto issued last month by Sarush Kadivar, forgive me for mangling the pronunciation of this name, Mohajerani, Ganji, and Bazargan. We've seen the green center of gravity, if you will, shift from pure protest mode to a thicker, more affirmative mode, with the contours of a vision beginning to take shape. People should know, Sarush has said, that what they, people should know what they want, not just what they don't want. People are no longer asking, where is my vote? But rather, what kind of society do we want to live in? The manifesto was, in the words of Robin Wright, the first concrete indication of what the opposition wants and what Iran might look like if it prevails. For now, Sarush has said, the Green Movement has made a point of working within the framework of the Constitution and has been careful not to trespass those limits. Maybe in the next stage, he continues, the movement will begin to think outside the box and consider redrafting the Constitution. But some currents within the democratic movement have already begun to think outside that box of the existing system, even before the Ashura demonstrations and their brutal repression by the security forces, widely regarded correctly, I think, as a turning point for the movement. There were signs of radicalization Reports on the student protests of early December underscored this. One report said, quote, fewer of the slogans were aimed at Ahmadinejad and more at Iran's theocracy-based political system, a shift that could further galvanize protesters and serve to destabilize the Islamic Republic. Another report emphasized that the protests showed a striking escalation in direct attacks on the country's theocratic foundation and not just on the June presidential election. Protesters burned pictures of Ayatollah Khamenei. They held up Iranian flags from which the Allah emblem added after the revolution had been removed. And there were more chants aimed directly at Khamenei, a taboo that has increasingly eroded since the election. In this same spirit, the appearance of the, of the slogan Iranian Republic has made this post-theocratic or anti-theocratic point explicit. There are critical tensions within the Green Movement about these developments. Debates are afoot over the most effective way to frame the movement's message. There's now much talk of a national reconciliation process, which has produced anxieties about the movement's leaders caving into the regime or selling the movement down the river. These anxieties are understandable, given the momentum that's been built and the sense of possibility that's been opened. Fears of a deal that would pull the rug out from underneath the movement emanate from an entirely legitimate place. They may, they may be unfounded empirically or exaggerated, in some instances willfully distorted by the regime itself, but the concerns reflect something very real, a desperate desire for a new day and an existential realization for many that this could be the only chance in their lifetimes to create far-reaching change. An ominous now or never sense that if the Green Movement's promise is dashed, there might not be another opportunity like this for a long, long time. This uprising, to quote Dabashi once again, has, quote, seen phases of civil disobedience and shades of civil unrest. But its skeletal vertebrae is a nonviolent drive toward democratic institutions that the current republic will either accommodate and survive or else resist and be washed aside, unquote. I'm not so sure I agree. I doubt very much that what Dabashi calls the current republic or what we might call, invoking Rudolf Barrow, the actually existing Islamic Republic, is capable of accommodating the emancipatory democratic demands of the Green Movement. 
Such a surgical procedure would more than likely kill the patient. I believe that this regime is beyond that point, not the regime of 1997 to 2005, or even the one of 2005 to June of 2009, but the one of Ahmadinejad's second term, if you will, with Khamenei's halo gone, the repressive state apparatus's gloves off, the hardline elements digging in deeper than ever, and the state militarized to such a point that martial law is by no means inconceivable. It's a stretch to fathom this regime accommodating even the demands contained in the Sarush Kadivar Ganji Manifesto, let alone the considerably more robust wish list of the grassroots movement, which only expands and gains popular traction with each day. Indeed, one might say to invoke Critchley once again that the political consciousness of the green movement is growing infinitely demanding. There is no possible scenario, Dabashi has argued forcefully, no possible scenario that will divert it from its main objective of reaching the goal of liberty, the rule of law, democratic republicanism, civil liberties, civil rights, women's rights, freedom of expression, freedom of peaceful assembly, freedom to form political parties, freedom to choose a democratic government, unquote. In this process of the unfolding of the movement's demands and vision, the groundwork for a new set of arrangements is being laid. This is what Antonio Gramsci called prefigurative struggle. His point, as Karl Boggs argues in his wonderful book, The Two Revolutions, was that a good part of what we call revolution actually precedes the conquest of political power. And it is this prefigurative dimension of politics that shapes the conflict of regimes, armies, organizations, and leaders. Beneath the level of insurrection and statecraft, there must be a gradual conquest of social power, initiated by popular subversive forces emerging fr from within the very heart of the society. Critchley and I share a fondness for a passage of Gramsci's that drives this point home. Quote, the decisive element, wrote Gramsci, is the permanently organized and long prepared force which can be put into the field when it is judged that a situation is favorable. And it can be favorable only so far as such a force exists and is full of fighting spirit. The essential task of that system, the essential task is that of systematically and patiently ensuring, Gramsci wrote, that this force is formed, developed, and rendered ever more compact and self-aware, unquote. The prefigurations of the current upheaval in Iran are, of course, 